Hi everyone, it's Russell here. Welcome to the Reading Fabricator and today I'm going to talk about a, a, to a genre of book that I don't normally read. And <laughs> it's noir. Uh, I tried reading, you know, Raymond Chandler before, you know, The Big Sleep and Elmore Leonard and all that sort of thing and I just could never get into it. I just, I just didn't, I didn't get it. Uh, that was until I came across William Lindsay Gresham's Nightmare Alley which was recently adapted into a novel, uh, sorry, adapted into a movie by Guillermo del Toro and way, way, way back, back when the book was, you know, printed in, in 46, it was optioned in 47 for, you know, a movie that's now out in the Criterion Collection. Uh, I can't get it here, but um, I can actually watch the whole movie on YouTube, believe it or not, so that's what I'm planning on doing. Uh, I started it, but I haven't finished it, and uh, so far, so good. It, it adheres to the book, I think. Uh, and it's just a whole new, yeah, just a whole new experience for me. I just, I wasn't entirely sure what to make of it. And to be perfectly honest, the first hundred pages, I was worried. I was worried that I was going to quit this book after a hundred pages in. Purely because I'm just, I just didn't, I didn't respond to it. I didn't respond to how the plot was going. But then as it moves along and you chart this, basically this rise and fall of the main character, that's when, that's when it drew, drew me in. And after this slow start, you realize that because of the, that you need that start of the book in order for everything else to work. So it actually, as a whole, was quite a good read. Now, William Lindsay Gresham is a fascinating character. Uh, so he died qu quite early. He was like 52 when he died by suicide, no less. And everything leading up to that, I mean, you feel sorry for the poor guy, Just it was all stacked up against him, but uh, nonetheless, he was unfaithful, he was an unfaithful husband, he was, he was suicidal, he tried to kill himself multiple times, he did succeed in the end with that last one. Um, and he was a massive alcoholic, I mean, a full-blown alcoholic, probably worse than Ernest Hemingway and Malcolm Larry, um, from what I hear. But back in 1937, when he was in his late 20s, he went to, to be a volunteer medic uh, during the Spanish Civil War, which was the same Civil War that Ernest Hemingway went to to be a correspondent. And while he was there, he befriended a former sideshow man by the name of Joseph Halliday. And throughout, throughout the next couple of years, they had these long conversations where Lin uh, Gresham just probed him for information about the whole Carney lifestyle. And it just, it intrigued him so much. And a lot of his fiction is based around these conversations. It just, uh, based around the ideas of, and themes of this sort of thing. And particularly around the noir genre. He was a massive, um, he was a, an advocate of Scientology. Uh, until he denounced it years later as absolute trash. And on top of that, his health was in terrible decline. So, I mean, I mean, by the time he was in his early 50s, he had pretty much the health of a 90-year-old. He, he had tongue cancer. He was diagnosed with tongue cancer, and he was going blind. And not long after that is when he killed himself. Uh, he checked himself into a hotel room, and it was the same hotel where, years earlier, he wrote his book, Nightmare Alley, um, which is this one here. Quite a quick read, actually. I got through this in like four days, so it's like, and it's almost 400 pages, like 100 pages a day. So I just I zoomed through it, and once once it, the pace quick uh, quickened up, I yeah, I was able to just keep on just going through it, wanting to know what happened next, wanting to know what happened next. And the way I saw it is that this book is divided into three parts. So we've got the first part, the first section, which details uh, Stanton, the story of Stanton Carlyle, a young Stanton Carlyle in his early 20s. First part of it shows him working as a carny at the carnival and is just pretty much just learning his way around the whole thing. Uh, the, the actual start of the book opens with him having this long diatribe about watching this geek, uh, you know, a, a an alcoholic geek and for those who don't know geek is someone who is brought in to do acts such as bite the heads off chickens or that sort of thing like that uh they're pretty much just there to disturb the audience and he says to himself that he will not end up like this geek whatever he does in life it will not he will not end up like this geek and it actually comes full circle at the end of the book i will not spoil it but it does come full circle so let that sink in. So the first, yeah, the first hundred pages details him working his way up, learning from all the different carnival acts uh, while the the show travels from state to state, usually around the southern area, southern uh, states from what I remember. Uh, 
While working at the carnival, he uh, pretty much does sleight of hand tricks, you know, small things like that. And he eventually learns his way into doing cold readings of people through uh, other carnies such as Xena and her alcoholic husband who pretty much have found this way to con audiences so that they know what the audience is thinking and what their future might be. It's, uh, it's quite, quite clever actually. And it all culminates in this one show where the police uh, show up and char shut it down and threaten to arrest a couple of people including Molly who ends up becoming his duo act later on in the latter half of the novel. But he stops it. it just out of nowhere he walks up to the policeman and gives this massive cold reading and it's like five pages long. And he pretty much talks this policeman out of doing, out of shutting it down and arresting the people. And it's absolutely brilliant. It's one of the, it's one of the best parts of the of the novel, just the way he speaks elegantly and all that. Before that, he was you would you'd think he was a mute because he doesn't really talk that much. And he it, it seems as though he's not intelligent. But really, what's been happening is he's just been taking it all in, taking it all in, and it just he explodes with all this just nuance and all that sort of thing, and is able to just let it all out and it just it hits you you sort of sit back and go whoa yes yeah, it's, it's a it's a it's a a keanu reeves whoa moment when this happens and that is where the book drew me and that is where i it clicked for me and i was able to just steamroll through it it ends with him being able to realize that he's able to do this now so he proceeds to live the life of a con man with along with molly who used to work as uh, her act at the carney was basically sort of you know she could be hit by electricity but not suffer any damage sort of thing like that sort of thing and he's also you know wanting to leave the carney because he harbors a big secret where he basically killed Zena's alcoholic husband by feeding him a specific type of alcohol that is used for wood uh, she he he dies the next day and it pretty much is on Stanton's conscience you know he keeps he keeps thinking he will get found out so he he, he leaves along with Molly and the book then proceeds to jump ahead I think four or five years and it shows them as a very successful act where they're performing cold readings and they're getting away with it and it shows you how they're performing the gold cold readings and it builds and builds and builds and it leads to basically Stanton becoming a reverend a spiritualist reverend he's referred to as Reverend Carlisle he builds he builds this church and money starts pouring in, donations start pouring in. He's able, he performs a seance at a woman's house and convinces her to give him the house. So he's conning his way up in life. He's getting richer and richer. He's gaining things out of it. People are following him. But he gets bored. He gets bored and he also gets stressed of the lifestyle so much as being put on his shoulders. Also the fact that Molly is at this moment sort of uh, becoming disillusioned with the whole idea. She doesn't like where this is going. So he goes to see a psychologist named uh, Lilith Ritter. And that is where the third part and final part of the novel comes in. When she comes into it, that is where it leads to the downfall of Stanton Carlyle. And I won't, I won't say any more than that because I don't want to spoil the book. But there is a definite traje trajectory here. It, it, it starts with him learning, then he rises, and then he falls. And I thought the ending was shocking, actually. The it was shocking and I didn't see it coming but now that I think about it there was no other way for it to end it was just it was a perfect perfect ending and it, it really really is a great noir I mean as I said before this is my first noir book I've ever read and it, it, it won't be my last now because I'm sold on the whole thing I think it was absolutely wonderful it's very it's hor horrific and it's creepy and <laughs> You marvel at some of the wordings in this. In fact, I'm going to read a section from, uh, in my edition, it's from page 227. I thought this was absolutely brilliant. Uh, I posted this on Instagram a while back on the story feed. I think it's absolutely just, it's completely different from everything else that's happened before. It, so it really stands out. Okay. In the spring darkness, the obelisk stood black against the sky. There were no clouds and only a single star. No, a planet, Venus, winking as if signalling Earth in a cosmic code that the worlds used among themselves. He moved his head a fraction until the cold, brilliant planet seemed to rest on the bronze tip of the stone shaft. The lights of a car winding through the park sprayed for a moment across the stone and the hieroglyphics leaped out in shadow. Car touches with their names, the boasts of the dead, invocations to dead gods, prayers to the shining, Fateful river which rose in mystery and found the sea through many mouths, flowing north through the ancient land. 
Was it mysterious when it still lived? He wondered. Before the Arabs took it over and the, and the chumps started measuring the tunnel of the Great Pyramid in inches to see what would happen in the world. That's the first paragraph. It, there's, there's like two or three more pages of that type of writing style going in there where everything up leading up to it was, you know, detailed and precise and was all about the story. But then this happens. And it's, it's, it, could, it could be his own separate thing. You could read it as its own separate thing and be something different. And I, I just that just stuck with me. I don't know why. I just I really, really like that passage. So, again, I haven't seen the movies, but I really plan on going to it. It looks like no one's going to go see the Guillermo del Toro movie. It's making almost nothing at the box office. But um, unfortunately, with the whole COVID thing that's happening here in Perth at the moment, I'm a bit hesitant to go see it myself. But um, I, I will watch the 1947 Criterion Collection movie uh, on YouTube. And I, um, I do hope I enjoy it. I do hope it's the rest of the movie is as accurate to the book as what I saw, even though I only saw like the first 10 minutes. But that's just my opinion, man. Uh, that's all I really have to say. And as it stands, this is out of the, out of the three books I've read so far this year. This is number three. I still prefer the other two that came before it, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood and Geek Love. In fact, Geek Love was a great book to read before reading Nightmare Alley. I mean, that's all about Carnies as well. So that was a great lead up into this, even though they could be more different. They're such different books. But that those, those, those two books are great. And this one here is also great. It's just that I prefer the other ones there. But don't let that turn you off. This is a fantastic read. Very well done. And there's also sections in the book, including uh, a backstory where Stanton Carlyle thinks back to his childhood and the first time he saw something of a sexual nature, which involved his mother. In fact, there's quite a lot of talk about, about him and his mother in this book, so I, I don't know if that leads to anything or if it's sort of a psychological issue type thing. Uh, and there's also a great section where he goes back to see his dad and he pretty much just does a cold read on him involving their pet dog and it's brutal. It's such a brutal scene, very well articulated. I loved it. I love that section of the book so much. The backstories and, and anything involving his family, I think, was really well written. On top of that passage that I just read to you just there. So if that seems like your sort of thing, then by all means, give it a go. If you have seen the movies, let me know what you think down below. Let me know if you think they're great. Uh, I probably will get to the 47 movie tonight, actually. I'm really looking forward to it. As it stands, I'll leave you to it. Have a good day, everyone. See you next time.